Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've managed to get your coffee in and you're getting your caffeine kick. So you'll be wide awake for a um, nice spot. So thank you for this opportunity to present. So um, quickly introduce myself. My name is Richard Francis. I work with, I'm a senior account manager within Network Rail Telecom. And I've been specifically uh, recruited and uh, within Network Rail to help promote um, Network Rail Telecom assets to the external market because let me just get on that. Yeah. So believe it or not, um, you may or may not know, but Network Telecom is actually the third largest telecom operator within the UK. So we've got um, BTL from Region Virgin, but we have, as, alongside the majority of our tracks, we have a dark fiber network, which has predominantly been used to deliver services to ensure that we can move big lumps of metal, i.e. trains from point A to point B as safely as possible. We've been doing this for a long time, both as a um, public sector owned organization. We had a bit of a period where we came out and for people who've got a bit of age out there uh, under RACL or level three. Um, and then since then we've been after rail track ended, we have renationalized and now part of network rail. So as part of the programme and Open for Business initiative, what we are looking to do is actually open up the assets of Network Rail to enable third parties to start utilise them to deliver services. So a quick picture of what our services look like at this moment in time. So I hope that you can see that very high level um, map of the UK. So that is Network Rail's fibre network across the UK. So... Predominantly, that's a 24 core fiber legacy network. However, we do also have deployments of 48, 96 and 432. Uh, alongside that, um, as I noted, there's approximately 90,000 kilometers of dark fiber. And currently, you know, we'll be using 50% of that capacity on some link. So there is a lot of availability of dark fiber to deliver services. As well as, you know, those services, we're not one unique around network rail is we're not predominantly focused around the main metropolitan areas. You know, we have got fibre pretty much wherever there's a train service and a train track, because this service has been linking together the signalling, the GSMR connectivity, some of our station connectivity. So if they've got a train station in that town, chances are we can deliver fibre to that location. And as well as while we do have a limitation of 24 core, there is plans which are currently going through um, sign off by uh, central government to actually upgrade this service. So like everyone out there, we've got a, a digital strategy, so a digital railway strategy. And part of that is a, a large expansion of our fiber capability. So that fiber capability will be to deliver fiber for our internal use, but alongside that is to deliver fiber for use by external organizations. So to sort of prove this case, what we did is Network Rail working with DCMS and BD UK is we looked at the TransPennine service. So going from Manchester all the way through to York, we had a requirement that we had to upgrade our fiber there from 24 to 48. However, as everyone who's been involved in the deployment of fiber uh, networks, the cost, the main cost for that is not the fiber itself, it's actually the man time going out there actually laying this service. So we um, went to funding to um, DCMS to say, well, instead of deploying the 48 core, can we go for a 432? So we got agreement and have deployed now a 432 spider web ribbon fiber across that full route, across the TransPennines. Um, and alongside that, all those pins that are in the map we have created FIPs along those locations for fiber interconnect points. So the objective behind this was one, to prove that we could deliver services for the external market, and two, to ensure that those services are accessible for markets, depending what those you utilize, those customers wanted to utilize it for. So any town or village, which is along that route, has access to this service, and there's most likely a FIP within several hundred meters of that location that they can access to deliver services. So the driver behind this is 
where locations may, will maybe not commercially viable to your large players due to, um, well, I guess, population density or the, the amount of, you know, how far they're off the main grid. This now starts to bring new opportunities, new services, you know, that alt nets or other service providers can start to look at because the backhaul costs, and as we know, the actual dig or subject to survey costs that we can get out there can make some locations a bit too expensive. You know, this can be a, hopefully a, a big change within the market. To ensure that there's breakout within the, um, for the service for the internet, we provide connectivity into Manchester IX and also Leeds AQL. And critically, if you've already got services along these routes or any routes in the UK, one key thing that we believe that we're bringing to the market is that diversity and security. You know, our service due to its nature runs alongside the rail corridor. So we're not talking about fiber alongside any A roads, the good old JCB dig threats that doesn't exist with, with our fiber service. So it's giving you a diverse route as well because we're not following the routes that your main providers would go alongside the railway track. But we feel that there's some uniquenesses that are coming in with regard to our solution, which can you know, fundamentally change the way network planners are looking at the type of service that they're looking to deliver. So what services are we actually delivering across this, uh, this network? So I'll be frank with you, you know, Network Rail, we are a very immature commercial organization. We're very good at delivering services to the top for train operating customers and internally, but we're just learning this experience of delivering it to our you know, commercial customers out there. So predominantly the first service is dark fiber. That is what we can, can look at. And we're looking at providing just dark fiber, the backhaul connectivity. So our A and B points will be at the boundary of the rail corridor that you'd be looking to access. And the sort of model that we're following is that there'll be a handover point at that rail bar barrier, whether it's a cabinet or a chamber, where organizations will actually interconnect into our network. A uh, number of reasons for this is we'll concentrate on what we can do. We're not looking to go down the PIA route or get code of powers or anything like that for the highway. There's other people who have got a lot better skill set than ours. We're looking at core connectivity backhaul type services. Also, the rail corridor is a secure environment. You know, it's a critical national infrastructure. Um, so we don't let third parties where we can help it on that rail corridor. So one, it gives security for that service for that fiber. Yeah, but there's limitations with regard to allowing people on that track, which the way that we do this handover is beneficial for all parties. So we can provide dark fiber and a single fiber, multiple fibers, you know, and due to the nature of uh, the railway tracks, you know, can do long-term leases, short-term or very long IRU. You know, 30, 40 years is a standard contract um, position within Network Rail. So we've got no fears about the long-term sort of arrangements that we're putting in place and the railways aren't going anywhere. Uh, just going live later on this month, we've got a, our first Waveland service, uh, DC to DC. So going between Manchester and Leeds. So we're providing one gig, 10 gig and 100 gig services there. You know, so if people want to move away from the, the fibre tax and the complications of dark fibre, that's not something they want to be interested in, then we've got that service. And then currently we're just going through testing of, about giving point-to-point -point lit services as well. Yeah, as you'd expect, you know, these services are very much being driven along the Transpennine route because that's where the initial deployment is, but those dark fibre services are available across the country with the other services um, to follow on. If there's any questions at any point, please feel free to jump in. So why network rail? You know, I've touched on some of these, you know, uh, reasons as I've gone through this presentation, but we're not a traditional commercial organization. You know, the, our aim is to open up these assets to enable parties to deliver services out there to the UK. So it's helping to underpin the government's gigabit agenda. Um, we see, see our sweet spot as maybe, you know, that last 10%, 15% of, of locations where people can get into, you know, central London, central Manchester, there's lots of fibre out there. But as you start getting to the, the towns and the locations, you may only have one choice or limited choice to get, connect, to get connectivity out there. Well, Network Rail has the option that they can actually provide services there. 
Yeah, I've touched on it's diversely routed. So if you've already got one service in there, but you're looking for some security with regard to your um, second link in case of outages, Network Rail is an option that we can provide that service. The infrastructure is in place, um, so we're not looking to do build. We have a very good um, availability around this service. So just to give you an understanding, in the last two years on our network, 19,000 kilometres, we've had four outages across the whole network, which because of fibre failures, and now has amounted to 53 minutes. So it's a very secure, very stable network that we're looking to utilise because it's got to be stable, because it's got to support the railways. And if it goes wrong, you know, we can all understand what catastrophe could happen there if the signalling fails. So we're very confident in the performance of our fibre. But also to complement that, we're not just looking at our fibre estates. Alongside the rail tracks, we've got approximately two and a half thousand masts. And those masts currently have just got a GSMR aerial. So if you look at the picture, just at the top there, GSMR um, mast, and the rest of the masts are not being utilised. Again, historically, we've kept that internally and um, not opened it up, but now the, this new mindset and driven over under the projects of Open for Business, we're now allowing third parties to put their equipment, whether it's 5G, whether it's microwave, subject to the mass being able to support it, put your equipment on those masts. So we start starting to believe that by bringing this together, it's starting to give a compelling end-to-end -end solution. So we haven't just got the core fibre connectivity. We've now also got those masts where we can plug that fibre, that core fibre connectivity in to provide that middle, middle miles to get to your local areas. And then obviously, Obviously, we're looking at the local providers who are going to do that last mile capability where they've got that skill set, that knowledge for handling and dealing with the consumers. You know, we don't see ourselves as an organisation which will be dealing with end parties because we're not sized or skilled to do that. So for the math, the benefits are already in place. So it's a simplified planning permission, um, you know, accelerated deployments. You know, we still have to go through telecoms clearance and everything like that, that should just to ensure that there's no interference, but it's another element of these assets which we are opening up to the market. So it's again, it's just a quick summary of where we are. It's that diverse routing, secure pathwork. It's another choice out there on top of the traditional players. You know, it's that access, there's increased fiber, increased internet points. So look at those locations, which were maybe not within your project plans where you thought there was opportunity, but you couldn't deliver services out there. We believe net it's worth conversations with ourselves at Network Rail as, you know, those can now come back into a opportunity for you to look at. And just really starting to open up the country. So whether it's Wales, across North Wales, we've even got links running north to south in Wales, through Scotland and England. So really across most of the UK. So aspirations, it's really to help drive the gigabit agenda of the UK government. We are a, a central government, a government funded organisation. So our aspirations are slightly different from what you see as a um, traditional commercial organisation. It's not focused as much on the pound and pence, which we still need to cover our costs as you'd expect, but it's to underpin and help the deployment of that what we would like to see 100% coverage, but we know it's reduced to 85, but hopefully we can help to push that up. You know, the you know, we're aware of the challenges out there, which is why we have, have had this shift internally with regard to opening up and hopefully being easy to do business with. And as I said, please hang with us. We're still learning. We're still going through that process, but as things go, it should become more and more streamlined. Yeah, and our priorities is really and especially mine, because I'm purely focused on external customers, is just to ensure that we can get this out and get people utilising this network. So that's a quick run over of where we are, what we're looking to do and why we're trying to do. So I'll open it up. If there's any questions from anybody, please shout out. Yeah, thank you, Richard. That's uh, really interesting. We do have a couple of questions that's come in the chat. The first one is from Blake. He says, would you consider providing C-band optical spectrum on a on an IRU basis? Um, we yeah we do provide IRU contracts. That is our preferred route, um, rather than but we can do leasing options. So 
yes, we are open to those conversations. Okay, that's great. Next question is from Simon Locker. He says, there is concern amongst people I've spoken to about this, that repair time scales can be extremely prolonged due to having to wait for the railway line to be closed. Can you comment on this? Yes, so historically, what we have is, the challenge around that is that um, when we are doing repairs, so the way that the network rail network has been configured at this moment in time is that um, we have, we've got resilient loops built in. Um, I know the risk of what you're saying is that to work on a live track, there is, if the engineers are at risk, that they have to stop the trains to enable to do that work. However, what we're looking to do um, and get an agreement is the SLAs, they may not be as quick as you see in some of the market, but there's an expectation that there's going to be a 24 hour SLA to deliver performance back into the market. Um, the way that we're doing that is we've got our internal maintenance um, organization to support this, as well as an overlay organization where we're having conversations with talent. So across TransPennine, we have both organizations that we can actually call out to enable us to remedy faults a lot quicker um, and move forward to where historically it may have been like a two, three day close down. We, are, we know that we have to step up with our um, SLA agreements and we're looking to improve this as we go through the process as well. Yeah. But I'm happy yeah. to discuss that in more detail and highlight the sort of contractual agreements that we'll be putting in place. Yeah, so there, there was a second part about, about who to talk to if they're interested in this. Is that actually coming to you yeah. directly? Yes, yes, come to me. Um, I've stopped sharing my screen, but um, I'll fire it out. But it's just richard.francis at networkrail.co.uk. 